let's give a warm Louisville welcome for Daniel Altman. All right, how is everybody today? Good. You all have your coffee and tea and other caffeinated beverages this morning? That's good, because we're going to talk about economics. Um, <laughs> Uh, it's great to be here. It's actually my first time in Kentucky. I've been in Tennessee many times, but uh, first time in Kentucky, uh, I have already sampled the whiskey and the barbecue, so feeling good. Um, and uh, I, I'm really grateful to the Ideas Festival sponsors, J.P. Morgan, and everybody for, for having me. So uh, let's get started. I'm going to talk to you for a while about the economic outlook in the United States and other important places in the world that affect what happens here. And then we'll have a nice Q&A, but first I'm going to dump a lot of information on you. I'm going to try and teach you the way that I think about the economy, because economics really at its fundamental level is a way of seeing the world. It's a way of analyzing what we see around us. And there are other ways to do that, right? The physicists have one way, you know, sociologists have another way. But we as economists, we have a sort of worldview, and so I'm going to try and teach you how we think about the changes that we see from year to year in the world. So a quick overview of this talk. First, we'll talk about some trends here in the United States, then some trends abroad, going to be looking at the European Union and China, and then we'll talk about how we might make things even better here, given what we've learned about what's going on here in other places. And we'll have a Q&A. Pretty easy overview, right? Yeah. <laughs> so the big trend that I see when I look at the US economy is a gradual slowdown in the growth of our living standards. And that may sound depressing, but don't worry, it happens to everybody. And now I'm going to explain why it happens to everybody. You know, there are some easy ways to grow. If you're a, an economy that's a relatively poor country, there's some easy ways to grow. That's the good news. We call them low-hanging fruit. One way, urbanize your population. Get people off the farms, into the cities. Why would that work? Well, if you bring people into the cities, you can get them working in big factories, big service operations. These are the places where you get economies of scale. These are the places where you can do a lot of production using minimal infrastructure rather than distributing all that production across many sites as you would with little tiny farms. Get them into the cities working with economies of scale. You can put capital in front of them, machinery, equipment, all that stuff. You need to get a lot of people in one place to do that. That tends to raise living standards because that makes all these people more productive than they would have been if they had just been staying on that farm working by themselves. It also means that the next generation, their kids, have much better access to health and education and other public services because it's so much easier to reach people when they're all in one place with those services than if they were living all around the, world, all, all around the country. So urbanization is a surefire way of raising living standards for the current generation and for the next generation, and we see it in almost every country. If you look at the growth paths of the United States in the last century, then Japan, then Korea, and now China, Vietnam, urbanization tracks really well with raising living standards. And the other way to get these low-hanging fruit, another one of these easy engines of growth, is to adopt technology from around the world and bring it into your own economy. Right? You don't have to reinvent the wheel. You can borrow technology that's already been developed in more advanced economies and then use that technology to produce the same sorts of products but at a lower cost because you have lower incomes, lower wage rates, easier access to raw materials perhaps. All these things help you to borrow that technology, produce and then export at lower prices and that brings a lot of business into your economy, starts to raise living standards. You can sort of leapfrog. You don't have to reinvent the wheel, as I said. These are easy ways to grow. You can see the US did it, Japan did it, Korea did it, China's doing it. In fact, China's getting closer and closer to the frontier, as we'll talk about later. But eventually, these things run out of gas. You get diminishing returns, right? OK, I got everybody into the cities. I gave them some machinery and equipment and other types of capital to use. All right. Everybody's got a computer in front of them. What if I put two computers in front of everybody? Well, maybe that would make them a little more productive. You know, two screens. I have two screens at home. 
what if I gave them three computers each? Do you think that third computer is making a big difference to their productivity? <laughs> Maybe not. So you get these diminishing returns, right? You got to figure out different ways to grow. If you want that long-term steady growth after you have used up those two easy ways to grow, you've eaten all the low-hanging fruit, you've got to rely on innovation and entrepreneurship. You are at the frontier. You've got to push the envelope now by coming up with new ideas. And that's how the United States grows now. We've used up pretty much all those low-hanging fruit. You know, only about 1% of our workforce works in agriculture. Okay, we are pretty much urbanized. You may say suburbanized as well, but we've done that. And there's no technology we can really borrow from other places because we've already adopted it. We are at the frontier. We are the ones inventing the new technology. So, growing this way is more difficult. But that growth rate tends to be steady too. And pushing the envelope is the only thing that will help us to continue to grow. Well, what does this look like graphically? I put a little graph together for you. Whoops, went two clicks, there we go. So this is GDP per capita growth in real terms. What that means in English is this is the average per person of all the income we generate in the economy adjusted for prices from year to year, so adjusted for inflation. And what I've done here is I've taken out all the negative years. I'm not just doing that to be rosy. <laughs> I took out all the negative years just so I could show you everything from zero on up. And these are all our years of growth per capita. And what you can see is, if you just look down that graph, the sort of tall trees are getting shorter and shorter. Right? There's a lot of noise up and down. I put in a couple of curves there. One's a log curve, one's a linear curve, just to show you what the trend is. But the trend is pretty much settling down into a valley. And that's exactly what you would expect given the story that I just told you about eating up those low-hanging fruit. And we're gonna be at that steady growth. We're almost flat, as you can see. We've pretty much settled into that long-term steady growth path, which is at about 2% per year. That's probably what we're looking at until there's some major technological revolution that bumps us up onto a higher curve, as it were, for our growth. This isn't depressing, this is natural. <laughs> and when you hear people talk about st secular stagnation or a great slowdown, something like that, this is really all that you need to know. Now, if I told you, well, you're gonna see per capita growth in incomes of 2% per year, you might say, well, that's not so bad. Adjusted for inflation, that means my salary should be going up 2% every year. Salaries aren't going up 2% per year, though. <laughs> and as you know, if you've been reading the papers, salaries, or at least median household incomes, haven't been going up that much for decades. Why is that? Well, a big reason is the erosion of workers' bargaining power. Think about the economy as made up of two people, just two. One of those people is the only worker in the economy, and the other is the only shareholder in the economy. So one of them owns all the labor, and one owns all the capital. They get together, one contributes his labor, the other contributes her capital, and they make stuff. And that's all the output of the economy. And they sell that stuff, they get some money, and then they have to sit down and decide who gets how much of the money that they earned? It's a bargaining problem, right? You gotta sit down and say, okay, well, you know, your contribution was worth X and mine was worth Y, and that's how much we'll, we'll give to each other out of the money that we earned. It's been a lot harder for labor to bargain in the past few decades. And when you can't bargain, your income's not gonna go up. Well, why has this been the case? One has been deunionization. You know, unions do a lot of things. Unions in the early part of the last century were really important for improving things like workplace safety, working hours. But then, as the century went on, we had laws to protect all those things, thanks in great part to unions. And unions became more about just keeping incomes rising because they 
increase their bargaining power by getting all the workers together. So when owners of capital want to bargain with owners of labor, there was only one person sitting on the other side of the table. That was that union representative. They couldn't say, okay, well, I'd rather bargain with some other people and see if I can get a lower price, right? You got a lot of bargaining power by concentrating it in the hands of a few people. Unionization has rapidly declined in this country in the last couple of decades, so it's down now around 13% of workers. It used to be much higher than that, but that means workers have less bargaining power. Another reason is globalization. You know, it used to be you only had to compete with workers in your town or workers in your state or workers in your country for jobs. Now you've got to compete with workers all around the world. And a lot of them are expecting lower wages than what you're expecting. So that takes away your bargaining power too, right? Because the owners of capital say, well, I could take my capital somewhere else, hire workers at a lower cost, and I get to keep more of the profits. You also have to bargain against technology. Not just other workers around the world, but technology that could replace workers. Automation, smart machines, things like that. You know, you're bargaining against robots, too. And finally, there has been a lot of consolidation in the US corporate sector. Think about this. If there's a lot of people now sitting on one side of the table representing labor, and the number of people on the other side of the table representing capital is getting smaller and smaller, all of a sudden it's harder for workers to say, well, you're not going to pay me enough, I'm going to go somewhere else. What if there's nowhere else to go? What if there's only one employer in town? And that's what's happening. The number of companies per worker in the United States, despite the growth of our country and all of our entrepreneurship, has been dropping because there's been consolidation and mergers in a lot of industries. So your bargaining power has fallen for a fourth reason. Now, it's kind of a perfect storm, and the effects are kind of predictable, too. Here's some work by Bob Feenstra and Peter Timmer, two really good economists, showing how labor's share of national income, all the money that we earn from selling all the stuff that we produce, how labor's share, the amount that goes to workers rather than shareholders, has been going down. And you can see it peaked in the early 70s. That was sort of a peak of unionization, too. It was over 66%, and now it's hovering down around 61%, 62%. Now, it may not seem like a big change, but bargaining power matters a lot at the margin. So you drop your bargaining power by about five percentage points, and all of a sudden it's a lot harder to get your incomes to go up. So we can keep growing at 2% per year. The question is, how much are your workers going to see of that money, or is it all just going to go to people who own capital? Another thing that we have to think about here is our demographic transition. Everybody knows about the baby boom. Baby boomers retiring. That obviously puts pressure on our Social Security and Medicare systems, and we hear about that a lot in the news. But it has a lot of really profound effects on our economy as well. We have longer retirements because people are living longer, they're healthier. So we have to ask ourselves, okay, if people are living to 80 instead of 70, how many of those extra 10 years should they be working and how many should they be in retirement? You know, should you be allowed to work the same number of years and have an even longer retirement on the public dime or corporate dime if you have a corporate pension? And we also have a couple of different effects on health care. This is really interesting, actually. You know, obviously, people need more health care if they're living longer simply because there are more years of life. But our health care is getting better, so people are on average healthier for each of those years. So you got more years, but you might be spending a little less per year. And, and this is having profound effects on our government budget, as I'm going to show you as well. There's also a need for more education. Guess what? A baby born today knows as much about science, technology, engineering, and mathematics as a baby born 2,000 years ago. <laughs> All right? And yet, to be competitive in the workforce today, you need to know a little bit more about those things than you did 2,000 years ago. So we simply have to spend more time in school. Right? We need more average years of schooling. And that just means people are going to be hitting the labor force a little bit later. So you know, you got this kind of squeeze going on where people say, I want a longer retirement, and I also need to 
get educated more before I enter the workforce. So the actual years where we're sort of in our prime ages for working aren't changing that much, but somehow we gotta support the people who aren't working as well. That's a difficult problem to solve. And the labor force itself is aging too. You know, it's a big risk to try and change careers when you're over 40 like me. Um, it's an even bigger risk to do it when you're over 50. People aren't used to taking new people into the labor force. I think there's even a new Robert De Niro movie about this. <laughs> uh, and, 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 but this is something that we're going to have to face up to. You know, age discrimination obviously is illegal, but, uh, but, but there has to be a cultural change too to, to, to look at older people more sort of just on the face of what they can do and, and not take their age into it as much because we're going to have to get used to having more and more older people in the labor force. This is something Japan is struggling with too because their population is actually shrinking and they need to, to get people into the labor force to keep their economy growing. So talking about what could happen with these two effects of health care, this is something very surprising that happened uh, 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 last year. The Congressional Budget Office, which is nonpartisan part of the government that calculates numbers for budget scenarios, things like that, they price legislation. They put out some numbers last year showing that health care costs were actually going to be a lot lower than they expected going up through 2020. And it was part of this effect that I was telling you about, that, that people are living more years, but they're also living healthier years. And so when they were calculating costs for Medicaid and Medicare, as you can see right here, they found that they were making big downward revisions. This is sort of giving oxygen to these programs, which we thought were in so much trouble. But, but the revisions, you can see, even for 2020, we're getting revisions as big as 15% in costs downwards. So you know, we, we, we talk about these demographic transitions as having unambiguously negative effects, but there are actually some positive things coming out of it as well. Part of the reason we're living longer is because we're living healthier. Here we go. Okay, so these are some of the big trends at home. Let's go abroad now talk about what's happening in other places. Dysfunction in Europe, we can all feel superior. <laughs> Europe is in a bit of chaos right now, as you know. One of the big things that's going on is uncertainty about the Euro, right? So, so there are a bunch of countries inside the European Union, not all of them, that share a currency, but the big ones, Germany, France, Italy, Spain, not the UK. Um, and it's a very difficult currency to share. The reason is the following. Think about the United States as a currency union, right? You've got 50 states, they all use the dollar. We have a currency union that works <laughs> because we can set one monetary policy at the Federal Reserve in Washington for all those 50 states. Because all those 50 states basically go through the same economic cycle. They go up and down at pretty much the same time. And there's a good reason for that. Because if one state is struggling, workers can leave. And if another state is booming, like the fracking states here in the Midwest, workers can come there from other places. So things tend to equilibrate, right? Workers go to the place that's booming, that pushes wages down a little bit because there's big labor supply. They leave the places that are struggling, that actually pulls wages up a bit because it makes labor more scarce, and it, it stabilizes the economic cycles between the states. And we also have the same Fiscal policy that covers all these states. Tax policy from Washington, the same for all 50 states. That's not true in the European Union. Neither of those things is really true. And they don't have banking regulations that are universal across the European Union either. They have some, but not all. That means that it's much more likely that the cycles of these individual countries using the euro will go out of sync. And then you will no longer be able to set one policy for all of these countries because some of them will be booming while others are in recession, how do you decide what interest rates should be for all of them? Very difficult to do. So the euro was born with these problems, and now these problems have culminated in things like the Greek crisis, where you have some countries like Greece that are in big trouble, long recession, and other countries like Germany that are doing just fine, and they're trying to use the same currency. There's nothing that the folks who run the euro at the European Central Bank in Frankfurt can do to help Greece because they'd be hurting other countries as well. Very difficult. I realized I've lost my antenna, so excuse me while I put it back in and then I can click again. Okay. Let's see if this works. I got lucky. Okay. Um, 
the big question in the European Union now is, will they try and be more like the United States? Will they integrate their tax system across different countries? Will they integrate their banking system? But these are countries, they're not states. They didn't all sign up to be part of one country. And so the question is, how much are they willing to give up their sovereignty, give up their power over these things, where they've already given up power over their monetary policy? And I can tell you, if they're worried about the fact that their economic cycles may still not be in sync, then this is something that's going to be disturbing to them, the idea that they would give up all these tools to some central authority. And it also brings up questions about the European Union as an economic entity. These countries not only have different economic cycles today, but they're also having extremely different prospects for the future. Some of them have younger populations and lower pension liabilities coming their way. Others have higher ones. Some of them are much more innovative. They have a lot of great years of growth ahead of them. Others don't. They're not as synchronized as the US in the short term or the long term. And so it's hard to figure out how this is going to stick together, and whether they're going to continue to integrate. One thing that they may get in the short term, though, is a big boost from refugees. A lot of refugees are trying to make it to Europe, right? Coming from Syria, coming from Yemen, coming from Sudan, all over that region. And it's really tragic what's happening because a lot of them are losing all of their wealth and sometimes their lives to make this trip. That shouldn't happen. If you ask me, the European Union should be paying their way because these folks create an incredible economic boost when they arrive. What do they want to do when they arrive? They want to spend money to get settled, get all the necessities, all the things they need, and then they want to work. Right? They're just fleeing places where they would have wanted to stay, except that you can't be safe there anymore. But they want to work. They're bringing their families. And hey, they're fleeing extremists. They're not extremists, right? They're fleeing the extremists. <laughs> so they could create quite an incredible economic stimulus. You may have to spend some money on them to start out with, right? Social services, charities, et cetera. Everybody's got to help them out. But they create an enormous amount of economic growth in the long term because it's not just their own production, but it's their children as well. Think about every immigrant as one person standing on top of a pyramid of all of the future generations, right? Looks like a family tree, one person at the top, and then each layer gets bigger and bigger. All those people are going to contribute to these economies. So a great potential boost for them. Now, against that possibly positive scenario, though, the overall situation for Europe has been kind of dire, and that's why the dollar-euro exchange rate has gone down so much. Right? The euro used to be worth $1.6, roughly, $1.60. Now it's down around $1.20, a little bit lower. And that's because people have been moving money out of euro-denominated assets, stocks, bonds, other stuff. They've been bringing it into the US and other countries. This is kind of a bad sign, <laughs> right? This, this means we don't want to invest in your region anymore. It's too uncertain. And who can blame them? Because uh, even if you've got a good company there, your company sells stocks and bonds that are denominated in euros, you don't know what the euro is going to be worth. You don't even know which countries are going to be in the euro five years from now. <laughs> so how can you predict how much that stock or that bond will be worth when you sell it in euros and then turn those euros back into dollars? Very difficult to know. So this is a challenge that's facing Europe in the long term, and it's something that's having an effect on us because where people used to want to diversify away from dollar-denominated assets, our own stocks and bonds, things like that, and, and they saw the euro-denominated assets as a good alternative, now it doesn't seem like such a good alternative anymore. So it keeps the money flowing into our country, which allows us to invest ourselves without saving a lot of money. I also want to talk about China today because it is one of the three biggest economies in the world, if you count the US, the European Union, as the first two. And China grabs a lot of headlines because China's a big country that's growing fast. Even now, in a bit of a slowdown, it's still growing a lot faster than the United States or European Union. Why? Because it's pursuing that classic growth path. It's eating all those low-hanging fruit, right? China's level of urbanization it's much lower than that in the US. It's funny, if you look at Japan, Korea, and China, those three countries that I mentioned as well as the US, you know, we know you can just look by the cars that you see on the highway to tell which country developed first, right? Japanese cars, <laughs> they're a little better than Korean cars, which are a little better than Chinese cars, right? If you see a few Chinese cars. But 
Think about the way Chinese cars are now. How many people here would go out and buy a Chinese car right now? A Geely, perhaps? Yeah? Okay. How many people would have bought a Korean car in the 80s? <laughs> about the same number. <laughs> or a Japanese car in the 60s, if you were alive? You see what happens, right? They're, they're actually, these three countries are about 15, 20 years out of phase with each other. You know, what happened in Japan happened 20 years later in Korea, happened 20 years later in China. And they're eating these low-hanging fruit, and they're urbanizing, and, and they're adopting those technologies and exporting. But they're also realizing that they won't be able to do this for that much longer. As I said before, they're, they're getting pretty close to the technological frontier. They've adopted almost as much technology as they could. So now they can't depend on cheap exports for all their growth, and they have to say, well, let's build our domestic economy Let's get people using more services, the kinds of products that you want to use in your home, in your office, things like that, and let's make them here. They also have a substantial agenda to reform their economy, which still has a lot of this state socialist apparatus and control of the economy from Beijing, big state-owned enterprises, you know, public businesses, and they also have a lot of control over individual markets, regulations, you know, banks can't decide what interest rates they pay on deposits. People can't put unlimited amounts of money in the stock market from abroad. They want to liberalize these things. They want to unlock some of these aspects of their economy. But while this could be great, because it could inject a lot more growth, both from at home and abroad, into their economy, there are a lot of vested interests who don't want it to happen. Right? If you're running one of those state-owned enterprises and you're being paid like a CEO of a private enterprise, you don't necessarily want the government to say, hey, your job doesn't exist anymore because <laughs> we're taking this company public in the stock market sense. So this reform agenda is facing some obstacles, but it could be the path to future growth. It could help China to move to a higher curve, right? If they're eating all those low-hanging fruit and they're facing that long slowdown like the U.S. until they fall into a valley, you know, right now it seems like the valley in China would be a bit lower than in the US because their economy is not as innovative and entrepreneurial as ours. But if this reform agenda succeeds, it'll help them to move up to slightly higher value, maybe closer to where we are. Along the way, though, there's going to be a lot of disruption, not just these vested interests that are going to lose their holdings and maybe their wealth, but also every time you unlock a certain part of the financial markets or, or a certain asset class, you're going to create disruptions because people are going to move a lot of money from one place to the other. And China doesn't like that kind of disruption. So the question is how gradually they'll want to do that sort of thing. One of the areas that has been particularly fascinating lately is uh, what's called the shadow banking market. And this is playing a huge role right now in what's happening in China's stock markets. As I said a minute ago, in China, the rates that banks can pay on deposits are limited. In fact, they used to limit all the rates on deposits and on borrowing. Well, if you can only pay, let's say, 2% on deposits, but the economy is growing amazingly well and there's lots of profits to be made, maybe you want to offer your customers a different type of deposit product. And you say, OK, I can only give you 2% on a regular deposit account, but if you put your money into this special account, I'll give you 5% guaranteed every year. Sounds good. So what do you do? You say, okay, I'm going to take this money and I'm going to invest it in some big construction projects, real estate projects, the kinds of things that were really growing in China a few years ago. And you know, when, when these projects get sold and occupied, I'm going to be making 10%. So it'll be no problem to pay 5% to all of my investors. I'll just take whatever is left off the top, which is great. Lots of money. Well, that construction real estate bubble kind of burst in China. So all these folks who had promised high returns to their depositors had to come up with another way to get those returns. And so they started putting money into the stock market because the stock market was going up as well. Fabulous. But what happens here is that it becomes a sort of Ponzi scheme. Right? You put money into the stock market. Heck, supply and demand, if enough people want to buy those shares, price is going to go up. Price starts going up. All of a sudden, you say, wow. I could actually promise a 6% return instead of a 5% return, and I'd get even more money from these investors. So I say 6%. I get even more money. I put it into the stock market. Stock prices go up again. <laughs> and as long as 
I continue to get these investors putting money in, I can continue to push up those stock prices and I can continue to pay them the returns that I promised. But none of it is based on fundamentals. None of it is based on these companies having expectations for better profits in the future. It's all supply and demand. So eventually, you get a bubble that's going to burst. And that's what happened. But what hasn't happened yet is there hasn't been a cash call on all those shadow banking products. What happens at the end of this year when it's time to pay those 5 and 6% and even higher returns? What if they can't pay? Then we're going to see a lot of banks needing help from the government. We're going to see other institutions needing help. And the government has a habit of bailing out investors because it doesn't want people to feel like participating in the economy and financial markets has burned them. So it's going to be a big challenge for China coming up and a big challenge to the financial markets around the world. To give you an idea of just how big this is, here is a chart showing you the number of these what are called wealth management products. These are these high rate accounts that I was describing. This is the number that were issued every week in 2013. Number of different products and the rates that they were paying. So you can see that you started out with about 800 of these products that were paying 3 to 5% and a few that were paying 5 to 8%. And then towards the end of 2013, as the stock market started to shoot up, you got a lot more that were promising 5 to 8%. And nobody was promising 3 to 5% anymore because it wasn't competitive. This is the problem. They're going to have to pay those returns no matter what. And they're going to have to find the money somewhere. And if they can't even pay back the principal, then Chinese government's going to be on the hook probably for a lot of money. So this is something yet to unwind. Now, I've talked to you about what's happening in the US. I've talked to you about what's happening in Europe. I've talked to you what's about what's happening in China, which could reverberate in our own financial markets, because our investors have money in China, too. If they get burned there, they're going to have to sell here, too. What can we do to project what would happen in some of the smaller markets? Right, I'm talking about the emerging markets, smaller than China, places like Malaysia, places like Ghana, what's happening there? Well, they've been suffering a lot of ups and downs, as you can imagine, as the US and Europe and China have gone through their tribulations. They definitely have a strong basis for growth in those low-hanging fruit that I was talking about before. Right? These are generally poorer countries that can really take advantage of those engines. But one of the downsides for them is that they have to compete with big countries like China for some of their exports. But well, it's not always competition. Sometimes they're supplying China as well. This gets them into trouble too, though. What happens when China's weak? Well, I told you that when the European Union was weak, people started getting out of euro-denominated assets. And so the euro went down because I sell my German stocks and then I sell the euros that I got in return so I can switch them back into dollars and invest somewhere else. The same thing happens in China. If I sell my Chinese assets, you know, I'm going to want to sell my Chinese currency as well. And sometimes the government says, well, we think that the currency should have a lower value too. And you have heard accusations of currency manipulation against China for years now. So the government actually says, we're going to push a lot of our currency into the market. That'll raise the supply, push down the exchange rate. And then, all the other countries in the region say, whoa, hold on a second. If China's currency is worth a lot less, OK, it's harder for us to compete with them if we're selling the same products. But it's also harder for us to sell products to them because people in China now have a currency that's worth less. It's harder for them to buy stuff from the rest of the world. So if we're a supplier to China, we're in trouble too. <laughs> as a result of that, that could push our currency down as well because investors start saying, well, you know, Malaysian companies are no longer as viable because it's going to be harder for them to sell stuff to China. So you get all these currencies dropping at the same time and it makes competition even stiffer between these countries for exports. Another thing that we see, and tell me if I'm getting too technical here. You can raise your hand if I'm getting too technical. <laughs> Another thing that we see in these emerging markets is that they all tend to get tarred with the same brush by investors. Let's say that the following happens. Let's say that Malaysia has a huge fiscal crisis. They have too much debt. 
They've issued too much currency, their currency becomes worthless, and investors in New York and London and Tokyo recoil in horror and say, oh my gosh, Malaysia's a lot riskier than we thought it was. Well, every week they're looking at their portfolios to see how much risk they're holding. And when one part of their portfolio blows up and seems a lot riskier than it should be, they have to pull back their investments in other risky assets. So they're going to say, oh, I'm in all these other emerging markets that look kind of like Malaysia. I now have to pull back my investments in those places as well. So Malaysia goes down, the whole region goes down. Indonesia goes down, Cambodia, Vietnam. This has happened a couple of times in the last several years. None of this, again, has to do with what was happening in Indonesia or Vietnam. <laughs> Those economies are just toddling along, doing just fine, and then Malaysia has a problem, everybody has a problem. So this is something that tends to affect these markets really strongly. That's why we get more volatility there. They're also worried in these countries about what happens when interest rates start going up. Right? We think that the Federal Reserve is going to raise interest rates. Other central banks may eventually do that too as global economies finally recover from our current situation. Well, when that happens, it's going to be a lot harder for people to borrow money and invest in these emerging markets which supposedly offer higher returns. And so on one hand, okay, it means that our economies, the big economies of the world are doing well, so we're going to probably import more from those emerging markets. But on the other hand, it makes it harder to invest in those emerging markets. So every emerging market you look at, you want to ask yourself, are they more dependent on exporting to the big countries, which are now doing better, so that's good? Or are they more dependent on money flowing in from the big countries, which is going to be more expensive, so that's bad? So we're going to see a lot of volatility from that too. You can see if you look at the uh, CBOE Emerging Markets ETF Volatility Index, in English this is basically an index of variation in the prices of shares from these emerging markets. There was a big spike in volatility in 2011. We had another one you can see in the May 2012, May 2013. As I said, these things have been happening on an almost yearly basis, but the biggest one came just recently at the end of this graph when China devalued its currency. As I mentioned earlier, that caused this sort of cascading effect through lots of emerging markets and created a ton of volatility. And we're probably going to see more of that coming up soon. All right, we've been all around the world at this point, so let's come back home. And in the last couple of minutes that I have, I want to discuss a couple of ideas for making things better here. As I said at the beginning of this talk, we're down in this valley now. You know, we ate all our low-hanging fruit, and we came down to this valley, which is probably where we're going to stay until something really fundamental changes in our economy. So what could we change to make our economy that much more competitive, to raise those rates of return? So even with labor's crummy bargaining power, we might still see incomes going up. Well, I got a whole laundry list here. I'm happy to discuss any of these in more detail. I'll just go through it quickly now. One, a new GI Bill. Let's call it a globalization intervention bill. <laughs> so after World War II, all the soldiers returning from Europe and the Pacific were offered a chance to get an education so they could reintegrate in the workforce. Great idea, paid huge returns to this country. Well, we're seeing a similar level of dislocation now as a result of globalization and all the factors that we talked about before. So why not give those people who are dislocated by globalization, whose jobs have gone overseas or, or have changed fundamentally, give them a chance to retrain too? Because we have this aging workforce, we have people who are going to be working more years. You can't give up on a 50-year-old person, but you can say to that 50-year-old person, how about going back to school for a couple of years on a government dime, because when you get out, you're going to earn so much more, especially if you were just sitting at home before with no job, that you'll be contributing enough tax revenue to pay for it. <laughs> right? I think we definitely need to think about that possibility. Another one is a market for training. Firms don't train their employees enough here. You know why? because that employee could get that expensive training program and then walk out the door the next day. So we need to have a way for companies to trade these bits of training between themselves. So if you hire a worker who had a special certified training program at your company, you have to essentially pay their old employer for having done that if they then leave and go to a new place. Right? If we trade that training so that training always has value, then companies will do more of it. Equity investments in students. 
You know how we fund public education now? With a lot of debt. Property taxes, debt. What if we did it by allowing people to invest in students' future earnings? So that you could say, I'm going to buy the high school class of 2020 in Louisville. I'm going to buy some shares in them. And then I'm going to track them by their social security numbers when they enter the workforce, and I will start to pay that money back through dividends out of their income. Get a lot more money fed into students, I'll tell you that. Also, while we're talking about schools, you know how a lot of districts have some good schools, some lousy schools? What if your children were randomized into all the schools around your city? Bet the schools would be better all the way around, huh? <laughs> Because you wouldn't know where your kid was going to end up, so you better make sure all those schools are good. It's been done. It works. OK, if I'm running out of gas here, then we only have four things. OK, there we go, number five. There's hunger in this country, one of the richest countries in the world. We have a lot of hungry people, including millions of hungry kids, kids who can't get enough to eat every day. It doesn't make any sense. It's bad for our workforce development. It's bad for social stability. We can pay for it. But maybe we need new ways to do it because Washington isn't doing it. So how about a point of sale donation every time you go to fast food? Every time you go to fast food restaurants, chains that go all the way across the country, thousands of locations, would you like to donate a dime to fight hunger in the US just as you're about to pay? It's been done in other areas. It works. Golden rule budgeting. Why do we have to balance the budget every year? Some years are good years. Some years are bad years. Why don't we balance over the economic cycle? So when things are good, we save for a rainy day. And when things are bad, we dip into that fund by legislation. This country is lucky because we have some of the most far-sighted possibilities as investors. The US government is a great place to put your money if you're a taxpayer, because you know it's going to be around for a long time. So why not start investing? Invest in those long-term risky things. We already do it through our funding for science. Why not do some other risky investments and make money for the taxpayer? And finally, you're never going to solve the inequality problem in this country if you don't tax wealth. I'll just say it. I'll just put it out there. You're never going to solve it if you don't tax wealth. So how about, <laughs> how about a hybrid income and wealth tax that makes you pay a tax on your income depending on how wealthy you are? It's an income tax, actually, but it's based on your wealth. That would be constitutional, not too hard to implement simpler than our current tax system. All right, with that, I've gone over a little bit, so I'll just go straight to Q&A, and thank you for your attention. I hope it's been engaging. Daniel, a lot to think about. Why don't we start off with the easiest thing? Um, and, and you can, guys can get ready for questions. Thanks so much. Um, I was listening for a minute. I was thinking, my goodness gracious, I feel like um, saying, uh, other than that, Mrs. Lincoln, how did you enjoy the play? <laughs> you know? uh, so let's, let's deal with this. Um, first of all, I wanted to get your perspective on two things. When you think about this economy now, we have thought, we, you know, we, we use the language of we, we've, we've had the agrarian economy, we've had the industrial economy. Then we have what some would say is the information economy. And then now we have something some people will describe as the creative economy. So what is the big language that you're using now to describe how it is that we create wealth and how is it that people might do it in the future? What's your framework for thinking about that? Yeah, as I said, I think it comes down to innovation and entrepreneurship. You know, we, we are at the frontier of, of human knowledge about how to produce goods and services. Mm -hmm. And we need to push back that frontier. That's, that's the way that we're going to stay competitive and, and make sure people still want American products all around the world. Um, and so I think all of those sectors can contribute to that. Um, certainly, there are some areas like agriculture where we're already so incredibly efficient, it's hard to imagine getting that much more efficient, right? right, right. Um, but we're opening up new industries all the time. You know, uh, I, last night I was sitting down at dinner with a, 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 a guy who is starting a synthetic DNA factory here in the area. Mm -hmm. That's a product that people couldn't even have conceived of 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, I, I think there's room for this to happen in, in so many different areas. The other thing you talked about, um, and I'd like to explore a little bit, is the notion of talent with regard to immigration. You spoke of uh, the advantage that uh, Europe might have, 
uh, by the refugees who are coming in from the Syrian um, um, uh, crisis. Now, why is it that um, for, right now we're dealing with the Trump mania, yeah. this whole anti-immigration issue? Talk a little bit about how we're going to change the politics of getting America to think about immigration in a completely different way, because I think you know what the demographics are. Yeah. I think a lot of business owners understand it a lot better than Mr. Trump, honestly. Uh, I, you know, they, they know how... They know how essential immigrants are to the workforce in this country. There are entire industries like food services, construction, painting that couldn't exist without the, the immigrant labor that we have, whether it's seasonal labor or permanent. And uh, we've benefited so much from the injection of new ideas and talents from around the world. Um, you know, you think about what happened after the Second World War. So many brains came out of Europe during and after the Second World War, and some before, too. Um, not just scientists, but composers and artists. I, I, it was a huge shot in the arm to us. It helped us to win the space race. Uh, I, I mean, th these were incredibly important. And, and, and you've got bright people like that, highly educated people like that coming out of the Middle East too. Uh, and many people who didn't have good job prospects when they were living there even in, in safety. And they want to work and they want to use the skills that they have. Um, I th as I said, I think business leaders, <clears throat> and I don't consider Mr. Trump a business leader. Uh, I, I think business leaders uh, understand this. <laughs> Um, and we need to have more of them speaking out about it. Let's go to some questions right over here. Yes. Yeah, yeah. My name is Hans Hanneman. <clears throat> My name is Hans Hanneman. I uh, teach computer science at Kentucky State University. And uh, first off, uh, the bet, I really enjoyed your talk. And as an engineer, because we're mortal enemies, right? You're an economist. Um, that, that's, so it can be done. That's great. Thank you. Um, the other thing is, uh, I'm originally from Germany. And what you said about Europe and the European Union, uh, and the Euro in particular, rang very true. Uh, one of the things that really struck me was the issue uh, that you mentioned of worker mobility. And of course, the <clears throat> um, European Union has been set up uh, for free movement of capital and people. However, it's not as simple because, yeah, I can, with my English skills, I can easily go to the UK or to Ireland to work, and uh, I have any right to do that as a European uh, Union citizen. Um, but Finland, for instance, would be a lot diff more difficult because even linguists have no idea what that. Finnish thing is. So learning the language is extremely hard. Um, so, and I guess that's why many of the promises didn't, didn't materialize. Now, yesterday we talked about the great sort, where people in the United States now um, have a, um, a, a problem, or not a problem, depending, um, where this movement um, also is uh, impeded by culture. Right, by self-selecting. So people, and we don't fly over country. We already have a problem here to attract good talent. What's the um, question? What's the question? The question is, do you, do you, do you see uh, that uh, with the emergence of, for instance, uh, possibly non-majority English-speaking states, um, that uh, we will set up new barriers um, to impede the movement of, of labor, basically, in this country? And uh, yeah. can we do something about it? I, I don't really think so. Um, I think for... Uh, most high-income occupations, uh, English is known to be essential in this country. Um, you have some lower-income occupations where you have people who maybe don't speak such good English, um, but they know enough to do that job, right? And, but that's true for every job, is the, is the point that I'm making. You know, if you have a higher-income job where you need better English, you're, 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 you're going to have to get that better English. And, uh, you know, on my street, there's a construction project with uh, Mexican and Polish workers, and they speak to each other in English or Polish or Mexican. <laughs> or, I mean, Spanish, I mean. Uh, uh, <laughs> with a Mexican accent. So, so you know, there, there's a, a huge fluidity there, and uh, I don't think it's gonna be a problem. Over here. Hi, I'm Bart Perkins. Uh, first of all, a comment on Donald Trump. Though The Economist summed up very well in an editorial. They said the Republicans should listen to his concerns and vote for somebody else. <laughs> uh, the, Fair enough, especially since his policies don't always reflect his concerns. So. Right, uh, but, I, I, but I, I do have a question. First of all, I heard, don't invest in the US, don't invest in Europe, don't invest in emerging markets, so where are you putting your personal investments? <laughs> um, you know what, uh, that is a personal question. Uh, I, I don't know if many people in this audience would want to answer, but um, I, 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 right now, honest, to be quite honest with you, and my writing has made no secret of this, I, I expect that there's gonna be a, a downturn probably in the next 15 months, so uh, I've got a lot of money in cash right now. Um, but uh, all those places aren't bad places to invest. I'm just telling you what's happening to their economies as a whole, but th those macroeconomies hide a lot of diversity, and, and, and there are always great opportunities for investment and lousy ones in every country, no matter how quickly it's growing. 
But you do expect that the, this will be, and I'll, I don't mean for it to be as long as it will sound, but the American century. Well, you know, uh, David Petraeus has come out with a, a new uh, study that suggests that it's at least the North American century because of, of the good economic integration we have here and, and the prospects for growth. Um, you know, the thing is that the U.S. now has a reliable engine for growth in, in our innovative and entrepreneurial culture and, and the ecology that we have for business in this country. We have to try not to damage that too much. Right. And consolidation of our corporate sector is one thing that could damage it because it makes us potentially less entrepreneurial. Right. Uh, but, but, you know, I, I think that we have a solid basis. What we have to do is, as I said, keep trying to push the frontier. Absolutely. Over here. Uh, yeah, Jason Heiner, Tech Republic. Um, you talked a little bit about the value of density and bringing, you know, in urbanization, bringing ideas and people together for economies of scale and those kinds of things. So I, I'd be interested in your thoughts of, um, you know, Silicon Valley and sort of you talked about innovation culture as well. You know, in Silicon Valley, that's, that's overheating, you know, uh, and it typically overheats at points where, you know, because of values of um, property values and, you know, things go up and then, you know, we're in this phase in Silicon Valley where now Silicon Valley companies are kind of exporting some of parts of their businesses elsewhere and you're seeing other centers of um, innovation rise. And so I'm interested in your, your perspective um, on that, about when that density kind of uh, overheats. I and mean, we've also seen it yeah. in the past century in New York and London and other Sure, places. sure. I, I, it's definitely something that happens. You know, I, I, you have these so-called clusters uh, which rise, arise organically. It's very hard to create a cluster of that kind of business activity. Many countries have tried to create their own Silicon Valley. Not easy to do. Um, but they find natural places to th that, that, that correspond to their business priorities that will help to contribute to their further growth um, as they disperse. Uh, you know, in New York City, you can see a lot of uh, financial institutions opening up big offices in Connecticut and New Jersey because they actually realized that's where a lot of their employees were living. <laughs> And so now all the PR and back office operations for big banks like UBS are happening in Stanford, Connecticut. Uh, I'd be curious about your perspective on the economics of environmentalism. In political discourse in the U.S. these days, we tend to pit what's good for the environment against what's good for the economy. Yep. And I'd be curious why you think that is, and in particular, what do you think we could do to uh, enable the, you know, enable people to either realize the economic benefit of having clean air, clean water, sustainable yep. land, that kind of thing. It, it, it's a problem with our short-term thinking. I, I think if we were to value these investments with a longer time horizon, not a, a one-year or five-year horizon, but let's say a 30 or 40-year horizon, we would see that they're actually paying dividends back to even the private investors who would invest in clean air technology, things like that. Uh, you know, it, it will reduce their future business costs. It will increase their future business opportunities. Uh, and, and, but yet we have so few companies that are able to do that because they're, they're subject to shareholders who have much shorter term demands for returns. If we could somehow shift our investing culture at the household level, the corporate level, even at the government level to a longer time horizon, so I think we would see that these investments made sense even from a single bottom line point of view. Don't, sorry, but just a quick follow up. Don't you think we also have to capture the cost of the externality so that it can be factored into the Well, that, that's exactly decisions? what I'm saying is that, it, it, you know, okay. those externalities like taxing, which seem like externalities now, they actually become private costs and benefits right. if you take a long enough time horizon. It internalizes the externality. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Last Good two. Good morning. Uh, one of the more controversial, I guess, depending upon who you talk to, theories that have emerged in economics is this idea that the rate of return on capital is outpacing the rate of growth, and that's creating systemic income inequality uh, among many other problems. Wondering if you could comment on that as an economist and, and where you see that, that. Yeah, I mean, it's very similar to what I was discussing earlier. Uh, the rate of return of capital has been growing faster than the rate of return, uh, than the rate of growth because of the bargaining problem. You, know? it, you, you just get a bigger share of the pie if you have more bargaining power, and labor's bargaining power has been going down. So I, I prefer to tell it as a bargaining power story because I think it makes it more intuitive. Easy. Yes. Hi, I'm Melissa from Southeast Community College. I just wanted to know your opinion on whether you see a large-scale movement ever happening away from fiat cur currency back into commodity-based currency. Nope. Um, uh, no. Fiat currency is uh, much too useful to, uh, to drop in favor of gold or commodities or barter or anything like that. I mean, it just makes markets so much more flexible. It means you can turn on a dime if one thing uh, isn't what you want anymore and you want to get something else instead. You don't have to wait for someone who's willing to trade with you for that particular commodity or product. Um, nope. 
So, uh, Dan, let's close with this. Is shared economy, buy, sell, the whole. The, the sharing economy? The shared economy, as we think about it. Well, what, I mean, the shared economy is distinct from the gig economy. Uh, I mean, the gig economy seems to be doing pretty well, but the, 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 the sharing economy, if you're talking about things like Airbnb, yeah. mm -hmm. stuff like that, yeah, I think it's, it's ahead of the legislation that's there to support it. So as the legislation catches up, it'll become even more powerful as a growth industry. So buy. Uh, Long-term buy. Yes, very good. And, and identify those companies that are in industries where they have a real competitive edge, not industries where another entrant could come in and take half of the market. Let's give our, our distinguished economist a round of applause. Thank you.